there is a basic infrastructure that should be nationally owned. And on top of that, there should be lots of competition. If we had one national infrastructure project that put optic fibre down every street and every house in Australia, it would be cheaper in the long run than having duplication of services. That was the view of media magnate Kerry Stokes 16 years ago. Today, the reality is finally dawning, but still mired in controversy. The argument's still rolling like thunder across Australia's vast broadband landscape. Welcome to Four Corners. Even as this program was being made, the Gillard government's massively expensive national broadband network was continuing to attract unwelcome headlines. The construction tender has been cancelled. The construction manager of the public monopoly set up to roll out the network has resigned. And the cost of the NBN, already the most expensive infrastructure project in the nation's history, seems in danger of blowing out by billions. Our story tonight deconstructs the complexity of a political, technological and economic minefield where the stakes are enormous. It separates technology fact from fiction and gives some real glimpses of what the new network might achieve. We also reveal how a poisonous relationship with Australia's telecommunications giant Telstra led the government to bypass the private sector and build its own network, and why it opted for a world-class but top-dollar solution. Tonight, the ABC's economics correspondent Stephen Long goes inside NBN for this report. If the boffins and the broadband believers are right, we're building a brave new world. It's something which could really be a game changer for Australia. Remote surgery over the net. Medical and dental treatment through your television. Say ah, uh, Stephen. Ah. Uh... Now to life in space. World class education in your living room. You can actually have broadcast quality TV and lectures, etc., educational services in the home at the time of your choosing. A lifeline to the regions, bridging the digital divide. This is a fundamental backbone of what changes the game about how we as a country live and how rural Australia has any sort of chance or hope and how we get over the problems of urbanisation. You'll bypass the media moguls and watch what you want, when you want, delivered instantly. So what is the NBN? The government's rolling out the Rolls-Royce of information superhighways. The National Broadband Network is upgrading our communications and telecommunications capacity to world's best. We're opening the door to an exciting new world. But the future ain't cheap. Federal Labor's spending more money on broadband than any government in the world. At least $27 billion of taxpayers' money. And to the critics' dismay, the network's being built and run by a public monopoly. NBN. This is fundamentally a huge backward step. It doesn't keep driving the reform started all those years ago. It's sort of almost Soviet in, uh, you know, the way they're going about it. Armadale, in the New England region of New South Wales. The first place on the mainland where the NBN will operate. The driving force behind the venture is the Minister for Communications, Stephen Conroy. All right, so what have we got in here? We've got our fibre optic. It's got a port from here from those guys. Right. Um, so when you're ready, we'll go get into okay. it, eh? And where does, this, where does it go ultimately after here? Straight up over Straight the... Up over towards there. underneath these buildings. Then does a left, then goes out onto the road. Right. All right, well, let's get on with it. Let's let the boys know. Yeah, good to go, boys. Being pretty hands-on with your grand vision, Minister? Oh, no, it's very exciting. I mean, this is, uh, this is the first mainland site. It's going to be ready in a month or so to start live testing at the end of April. Uh, and the university have had a tremendous response to it. You got, so. you got a union licence for clearance <laughs> for the work? Uh, we've, uh, we've had a chat with the union and they're, uh, they're very, uh, very excited about the project. Uh, we're working closely with them. When the rollout's complete, 93% of homes, factories and offices across the nation will be linked up with fibre optic cable. 
The remaining 7% will get broadband via wireless or satellite at speeds of up to 12 megabits a second, as good or better than many urban users get now. An hour or so north of Armadale at Glen Innes, Hugh Eastwood can't wait for the new high-speed cable, or pipe as he calls it, to come. You tend to build a, your business to suit the pipe that you've got. If it gets bigger, we can create a whole heap more opportunity. He runs one of the biggest photo processing labs in the world. During peak production, his company employs more than 10% of the town's 6,000 people. We started out just processing film, analogue film, and then we moved into the internet and broadband came along and we could do digital prints, we could do digital prints on canvas, we could do photo books, and now we're only limited by the constraints of the pipe and what we can feed in. But the limits of the existing broadband pipe are already constraining his business. We're starting to run into, at Christmas times and at peaks at times, backlog and the range of products and types of businesses that we would like to get into are starting to be limited by the file size. So you need more access, faster broadband, more capacity to be able to expand your business? Yeah, there's no question about that. It opens up doors that your imagination can't quite conceptualise now. So we're incredibly excited about the opportunities for NBN. Hugh Eastwood passionately believes that the NBN will be the saviour for regional towns like his own. The NBN is the backbone no different to rail was to the 19th century or a road infrastructure is to the 20th century. This is a fundamental backbone of what changes the game about the how we as a country live and how rural Australia has any sort of chance or hope and how we get over the problems of urbanisation. There's no doubt fibre optic cable is an awesome technology. It works by sending information down a strand of glass as a light wave. Voice, video, text, all manner of data travel down the cable as colour at light speed. And the capacity is huge. Currently with the NBN, we're only sending the information down one colour. So if you think of the optical spectrum as a rainbow, there are in fact 132 different colours available for the optical fibre communication system. Initially, the NBN will be capable of bringing broadband to the home at up to 100 megabits a second, nearly 20 times faster than the average broadband speed in Australia today. This is easily upgradable just by increasing the speed of electronics to one gigabit per second, and then by adding multiple colours to the communication system, you could get up to 100 times that if the need arose. Capacity to meet future needs for decades to come. But the cost of laying fibre optic cable to more than nine out of 10 premises nationwide is enormous. Let's not kid ourselves. The reason the NBN is costing so much money is because they are pulling fibre through to every house and apartment in Australia. Building and running the network in the regions costs a lot more than in the cities. The good news for the bush, there'll be a uniform price for the same service nationwide. The downside for city users, you'll pay more than you otherwise would to subsidise the bush. What they do is they make it very difficult for competitors to undercut the NBN uh, in those areas. And the reason that's important is because the NBN will, in effect, be overcharging in urban areas so that it can subsidise its rural subscribers. New business models... To make sure city users take up the NBN, the government is killing competition. We have them creating this massive government-owned monopoly, uh, which, in order to protect uh, the, um, you know, shaky economics of this project, they then take steps to prevent anybody competing with it. Companies like Telstra and Optus and Internode will still be competing to sell you broadband, but they'll be dealing with NBNCO. It'll own the fixed line network. 
Technologies that could compete with the NBN are being culled. And not just the old copper wire. The thousands of kilometres of cable in the cities, built for pay TV by Telstra back in the 90s, but currently delivering high-speed broadband, will be shut down to the internet. You're saying the government couldn't afford to subsidise the bush unless it had a monopoly that essentially charged higher prices in the city? Absolutely. If you want to deliver uniform prices across the country, so you have a fair delivery, so you, just because you live in Broken Hill, you're not paying twice as much as you do in the city. This is not some incredible concept, OK? So that is how you deliver. The only way you can do that is to ensure that you have a government monopoly that can have the capacity to deliver that cross-subsidy. And we are unashamed about this. We're having a massive income transfer from Metro to the bush. Now, that may be a good thing, but don't hide it in the price. Paul Broad runs AAPT. Telstra's first competitor in long-distance calls. We now have 11,000 kilometres of fibre. He used to be a Treasury economist, back in the day when Paul Keating and Bob Hawke were transforming the country by opening up the economy to market forces and competition. And he's appalled by the NBN. The market is the cornerstone of change. Technology is driven by clever people coming up with clever ideas not by governments rolling out big infrastructure programs. AAPT has already invested nearly a billion dollars, laying fibre both between and within the major cities. But if it built the fibre out to homes and undercut the NBN, it'd risk a $2.2 million fine. I think it's fundamentally flawed. You can't cherry pick or you can't build infrastructure in to areas where you think you might make, it, might make a dollar. The cornerstone of success in this economy for the last 20 years has been competition. And in a free market, Paul Broad reckons it would be no contest. Let's envisage the alternative. If you could actually compete on price through your existing fibre with the NBN, what would it mean? Oh, we win hands down. I mean, they're going to make returns, presumably, on their new investment. We've either won or lost our money on previous investments. So you would be able to charge radically lower prices? Significantly low. But only in the CBDs of the major cities and maybe a ring of affluent suburbs. The reality is the free market can't deliver superfast broadband on the fantastic fibre to nearly every home. It's just simply too expensive for a private company to build this type of nationwide network. Will they build in specific areas where they can make money? The answer is yes. Will they build it nationwide? The answer is no. It doesn't commercially make sense for multiple players to offer those services in anything past about the 25% of the population, the dense, if you like, uh, cities of the population. If you're looking at the greater part of Australia, that infrastructure works best as a natural monopoly. If you go outside the CBDs, um, you don't have to go very far and the economics of the natural monopoly characteristics prevail. Smithton in Tasmania's remote northwest. <laughs> Ten months ago, the connection to the internet at this school was so slow it was almost useless. It worked slowly. I mean, if you wanted to watch a video, you'd, you'd watch two or three seconds, then it'd buffer, then you'd wait a while, then you'd watch the next bit. And, and in the end, most teachers weren't using it. So I'll just bring the clip up for you. Not now. This educational video loads instantly, faster than you could put on a DVD, and plays seamlessly. Technicians continuously monitor and manipulate its levels of oxygen and fertiliser. That's the difference is the NBN. The Circular Head Christian School in Smithton is the first school in Australia to be wired up, and it's transformed teaching and learning. There's a lot of lettuces there, isn't there? <laughs> I opened. Oh. Oh. Ten. Oh. 
The NBN will also allow this small country school to offer a wider curriculum by linking up with bigger schools online. We have 32 students in Grade 11 12 at the moment. And so to offer all the Grade 11 12 courses that you want to offer, we can't do that for 32 students. I currently have one student doing chemistry, one student doing math specialised. Now that's difficult to sustain, but if we link with another school, somewhere in Tasmania, even Australia, that's teaching that really, really well, has a great teacher teaching it, then our student can join that classroom, like a virtual or an online classroom. And suddenly the, they can stay here, they don't have to have the expense of moving away to study, and, and yet they can do all the courses that they want. And for children who are unable to attend school through illness or injury, the broadband connection is a lifeline. We're actually setting that up for a student right now who's off. She's got glandular fever, she's in grade 12, can't afford really to have too much time off. Well, we're setting it up so she can work from home at her speed and we can upload all the resources she needs, videos, worksheets, assignments, etc. And then she does that and then she sends it back to us. All on board at the school, but in the town, it's a different story. Even with free installation, less than half of Smithton bothered to get the fibre optic cable hooked up to the house. The next step is to sign up and get the internet over the cable. And trying to find someone, anyone, who'd actually done that wasn't easy. Kevin, have you got the fibre hooked up? No. I would say probably 10%. Yeah, 10%, wouldn't you? Yeah, it wouldn't be much more than that. The group of people that I'm involved with, some of them haven't even got computers, you know, so... Finally, after much foot slogging, we found Colin in the middle of home renovations. He's got it and loves it. I've got no complaints at all. Service has been great, the provider's been great. There's been no dropouts, no problems with hookups. Yeah, no dramas at all. Have many of your mates taken it up? Um, as far as I know, I've got one other mate that lives down the road, he, he took it up. But, as, but other than that, very few. We started to trial the NBN delivery in Tasmania, knowing we were picking some of the toughest markets. It's got the lowest take up of broadband, not just on the NBN, on copper networks. It has the lowest take ups, so we actually are very happy with the take up in Tasmania. The forecast, it actually said if you get 10% in the first year, you've done pretty well. We got 13 or 14% within the first 12 months. So we're actually ahead of the forecast. Now towns like Smithton are never going to pay their own way. If we want a wired brown land with fibre to the home across most of the nation, the government must be involved. But the way it's being done is awfully expensive. And back in 2007, it was not plan A. Nation building in the 19th century was about building a new national railway network for Australia. Nation building for the 21st century lies in building a new national broadband network. It's part of our pathway to the future. <laughs> It was the announcement that helped turn the tables in the 2007 election and sweep Labor into power. But the Rudd government's initial plan for a national broadband network was a far more modest proposal. At this stage, we were talking about a fibre to the node proposal. And that would be using some of Telstra's existing infrastructure. We went to the market with a $4.7 billion proposal to build the fibre to the node. The plan was to roll out fibre optic cable to big cabinets known as nodes on street corners, then connect it to the copper wire that currently delivers phone and internet. Not the five star fix of fibre all the way to the home, but far less expensive. The estimated cost was about $15 billion, with a government subsidy of less than $5 billion. But there was trouble ahead with a capital T, Telstra. You've got to remember, this was in the, the period of Sol Trujillo and Phil Burgess. They had waged war against the Howard government and its telecommunications policies. We have a broadband drought in this country because we have an addiction to regulation. And that addiction to regulation is stunting investment. Let me just say very clearly, very loudly, and very succinctly, 
broadband is the key to the future of Telstra. Before Labor came to power, Telstra had floated several plans to build a national broadband network. But time and again, it ran foul of Graham Samuel and the ACCC, which insisted Telstra let competitors access the planned network at prices Telstra deemed unfair. Graham Samuel just arbitrarily marked things off. He didn't base it on studies. He didn't base it on expert opinion. When you have a rogue regulator that doesn't play by the rules, when those kinds of things happen, then the taxpayer ends up footing the bill. The reality was that they wanted to upgrade, but only on their terms, and on terms that would put them in a very advantageous position and lock in a lot of the high profitability that they had, particularly with their voice revenues in the past. So they wanted to protect their revenues and their dominance? Yes, that stave off the, uh, the threat of competition. After the Rudd government was elected, it called for tenders to build a national broadband network. Telstra refused to play ball. While they'd indicated they were willing to participate in the fibre to the node proposal, when the rubber hit the road, we got a 12-page document, which was clearly deficient. Our proposal was real. It wasn't brochureware. It wasn't uh, just a, a spin. It was something concrete on which we'd spent hundreds of millions of dollars. We were not going to turn all those plans over to the government uh, without guarantees. They want us to open the kimono on everything that we had done uh, without any guarantees that our intellectual property would be protected. Well, look, Telstra knew what the rules of the tender were. Everybody else supplied thousands of pages of market-sensitive information, and Telstra took their decision under their former leadership that they were going to, in effect, call the government's bluff. On legal advice, Stephen Conroy's department determined that Telstra's proposal did not comply with the tender requirements. The government will not allow Labor's nation-building agenda to be held to ransom by any corporation. As a result, Telstra's proposal has been excluded from further consideration. The only company with the financial clout to build the new network was out of the game. Over the course of the period of the tender, the GFC absolutely crashed the liquidity in the financial markets. So many of the companies that had indicated that they were would be willing participants had no funding. And to make matters worse, the government received some shocking legal advice. If we were to go ahead with a fibre to the node proposal, we would essentially have to, not to put too scientific upon it, cut the copper. That would have meant effectively that we would have appropriated Telstra's property rights. And under our constitution, if you, com you have to have fair compensation if you uh, take someone's property rights. And no expert in the field, nowhere in the legal field, uh, commercial field, would give us a suggestion that the sort of bill you'd pay to Telstra was anything less than 15 to $20 billion. Plus, the expert panel advising the government warned that a company, Reed Telstra, could retaliate by building its own separate network in profitable city areas, killing the value of the fibre to the node investment. The government could spend $15 billion to build a fibre to the node network, pay 15 to $20 billion to Telstra for compensation, and then Telstra could take that money and build a fibre to the home network past you and strand 70% to $15 billion on the side of the road. And Phil Burgess says that's exactly what Telstra would have done. Absolutely. That's the way competition works. The only way it'll be stopped is if they have laws that prevent it. A month after Telstra was excluded, the panel of experts delivered its report. It said none of the tenders was sufficiently well developed to present a value for money outcome. Labor's election promise of a high-speed national broadband network was in disarray. Stephen Conroy's response? To jump on a plane. It was the only way he could get to the Prime Minister. So, on the plane between Sydney and Melbourne and then the next morning on the plane from uh, Melbourne up to Brisbane, we went through what all of the possible options were, what the challenges would be. Conroy's pitch? 
bypass Telstra and build an entirely new fibre network all the way to the home. An option the panel of experts had said was the best future-proof solution. And the Prime Minister decided that, yes, here was our chance to fundamentally reform the telecommunications sector, achieve structural separation, upgrade our network and ensure that Australians had the best possible telecommunications network without the structural impediments that we'd had previously. It was a backdoor way to break apart Telstra, fixing a failed privatisation that spawned a telco monster. I consider that we are fixing the mistakes of 20 years caused by two governments of both political persuasions. The end outcome is that something that has occurred that even I didn't expect a few years ago, and that is structural separation of Telstra. Plus, we now have uh, an independent government-owned entity that is going to provide wholesale-only fibre services. That is a radical reshaping of the industry for the better. We provide every one of our customers with the same services at the same prices under the same conditions using the same processes. So nobody is advantaged or disadvantaged in that arrangement and we have no conflicts of interest. If you regard the vertical integration of Telstra, that's to say the combination of their near monopoly customer access network with their retail business as a problem, then the answer is structural separation or functional separation. Achieving separation by building an entirely new network owned by the government is surely the most expensive conceivable way of achieving that change. The NBN is the foundation on which we will build an entirely new way of life. A small minority in the bush will get the NBN via wireless or satellite, but its primary mission is fibre to the premises, or FTTP. FTTP ensures that the maximum amount of bandwidth is available to your household or business 24-7. It needs the vast majority of Australian households, 73%, to take up fixed line broadband off its network if it's to meet its business plan. Malcolm Turnbull is among those who doubt that will happen. Increasingly, the internet is becoming a wireless internet. Mr Turnbull loves his iPad, and it's a useful prop to push his view that wireless devices undercut the case for the NBN and threaten its revenue. As people get faster speeds with fourth generation wireless, LTE wireless, where you can get, you know, on a, a device like this, you know, 100 megs over 4G, I think a lot of people will say, well, this is the essential device. I won't spend so much on the fixed line uh, alternative. Welcome to 4G. We just got a new version. But there's a lot of confusion about wireless. Just ask Ozzy Osbourne. 6, 6G. This is 6G. 4, 5, 6G, that old G. 6. This, this, OK, OK, it's 5G. 6G. How many bloody Gs are there? It's 5G. 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 Somehow the arguments morphed into, the future is wireless, so we don't need to upgrade the fixed line network. But the fact is, the more people who use wireless in a given area, the slower it gets. The spectrum that supports wireless is limited, and it's being swamped. We need to find a quarter more of that spectrum. So we've got to move services that are already using that spectrum out and free up 25% of that spectrum just to meet the forecast demand in mobile devices. Those who want to argue that we simply need an upgrade in our wireless network are ignoring the laws of physics. Talk to the technology experts. They will tell you these are complementary and we need both. To deal with the huge growth in wireless devices, Australia will actually need to lay a lot more fibre optic cable. Fibre will link the mobile base stations and ground the Wi-Fi hotspots that allow all those smartphones, laptops and tablets to work. The fixed network is essential uh, for future broadband. In fact, we're going to need both. 
um, and I think to set one against the other is a completely false dichotomy. But do we really need fibre all the way to the home? Today, it's about Virgin Media's 50 megabit broadband and the coming of age of our fibre optic network. If the UK and Europe is any guide, there's very little demand for it now. We can do all the things we want to do, but now we can do them faster. Virgin has a high-speed offer in the UK. Again, been out there for a number of years. 50 megabits per second, available to half the country. Take-up of that has been measured in the tens of thousands. Consumers just don't get as excited about these really high speeds as those of us who are excited about technology do, who work in the industry. Robert Kenny is a skeptic. He's a consultant and a former telco executive who's worked with Malcolm Turnbull, and his views have heavily influenced the opposition spokesman. Plus Europe have had fibre available for a couple of years now, and the take-up rate has been 17.5%. Very low. Very low. Less than one in five households has taken fibre when they're offered. A fortnight ago, he flew down under to weigh into the broadband battle. He says to justify a big public subsidy, Fibre to the home must meet three tests. If it's an application you can do with basic broadband, you shouldn't be uh, building fibre, you should just do it over basic broadband. Secondly, it needs to be something um, with a societal benefit. The government shouldn't be involved if it's just a private consumer thing, a consumer benefit. If there's some wider benefits for society and the economy, then sure, the government can get involved. And thirdly, the application needs to meet the test of something that requires connection to the home. Because there's lots of great things you can do with high speed to a hospital or to a business premise or to a school. But that's not what's being subsidised here. What's being subsidised is fibre to the home. Try telling Sandra Boucher she doesn't need the faster broadband the NBN will deliver. It's critical to her well-being. Hey, hey, sweetheart, you want a cuppa? Yeah, I'd like a cup of tea, please. And what would you like? Uh, a white tea. Sandra Boucher and her husband Gary live in Bendigo. Sandra suffers from cystic fibrosis, a disabling disease. Now, you might have to put some request dates in the um, in at work for some Melbourne trips I might have coming up. Sandra's illness requires numerous trips every year to see her physician in Melbourne. The five-hour round trip is too exhausting to attempt on her own. So Gary has to take time off from work. OK, well, let me know and I'll, uh, I'll get you, it organised at work, yeah. Could you use some carer's leave if we have to go on fairly short notice? Yeah. Oh, hi, Sandra. How are you? Oh, good, thanks, John. Sandra's been able to reduce the number of trips by teleconferencing with her physician, Professor John Wilson, though the news today on her lung capacity is not encouraging. And do you see which way the lines have gone on the most recent tests? Yeah, there's been a decline. Yes, that's a pity, isn't it? Because we had really hoped that they'd be going uh, the other way. Basically, now it'd be around about six times a year minimum. It's been up as high as 24 or more trips a year. So that potentially could be cut down to two trips a year. We've lost it again. Sorry, Sandra. We, we're just getting Unfortunately, one the, the ADSL line to Melbourne isn't exactly in good Sorry. health either. Um, how do you feel about that, Sandra? Well, for me, it's really frustrating. I, I feel that with the amount of work that I'm putting into my health care... An attempt to bring a third party online, Maxine Braithwaite, a psychologist, seriously strains the system. Maxine, how are you? Very good, thanks. And yourself? Very well, thank you. Thanks for joining us. Um, now, for some reason, this has all gone wonky. For John Wilson, it's a frustrating experience. So what did you think of that? Well, that wasn't clinical grade. What you saw was more like a, a domestic level uh, video system. It had a lot of dropout. There were audio interruptions. We didn't get complete visual image. And it's not up to the standard that we'd expect for using in clinical terms. So what do you need to make it a clinical grade connection? To get the best possible connection, we really do need uh, much faster download speeds and faster upload speeds. We need to have better access so that uh, all of our patients have basically got a high uniform standard of connectivity. 
There's already some fibre about around the country, obviously, that connects universities together. That's already done. Or that connects hospitals together. What we don't have is fibre that's connecting hospitals to patients and universities or schools to students. There's a halfway house. You don't have to take fibre all the way to the home. You can take fibre just to the end of the street. The cost is well less than half of the cost of fibre to the home. It doesn't give you quite as much bandwidth, it doesn't give you 100 megabits per second, but it can easily give you 40 megabits per second. So, uh, your lady with cystic fibrosis, she can have high quality video conferencing with multiple doctors simultaneously with 40 megabits per second. So even if you believe that the copper and the cable TV broadband is not enough, that doesn't prove you need fibre to the home. The critics are saying there are no applications that require the speed or the bandwidth that the NBN will deliver. Well, that's simply untrue, but it's also incredibly short-sighted. That would be like saying, you should, in 1927, you should only build the Sydney Harbour Bridge with one lane. You have to build capacity for the future. There's been an exponential increase in the data consumption on a per individual, per home basis, per, per business basis. So we've seen this, this very, very steep increase in the total data consumption. There's absolutely no reason to believe at all that that trend won't increase. It was high art meets new media and new money. After auditioning on YouTube, 101 musicians from around the world performed last month at the Sydney Opera House and to 33 million viewers globally online. Behind this extravaganza, YouTube's parent company, Google, part of the symphony of praise for the NBN. I think we do need the NBN and I think we need it for a number of reasons. One, bandwidth today is basically woefully inadequate. Alan Noble is engineering director at Google Australia. The amount of information that is expected to be basically moving over the internet between now and the next couple of years is exploding. The last figure I um, picked up was 56 exabytes of digital content every month. That's, that's the equivalent of 13 billion DVDs passing over the internet every month. I think it's also fair to say we don't know what we don't know. There will be applications that will be invented. And I'll quote one of my colleagues, Vince Cerf. He's father of the internet. Father of the internet, yes. He's gone on record and said basically that 99% of the internet's applications have yet to be invented. What is this image about? Can you give us an understanding there? Yeah, so what we've got here is um, a histopathology slide. Um, These scientists work with animal diseases that could kill you. And, um, it means that we can share um, we can collaborate on different diseases um, both within our, within the secure area and outside, and also uh, interstate as well. They're at the CSIRO's Animal Health Laboratory at Geelong in Victoria, demonstrating a cutting edge technology. It's going to be crucial for Australia's biosecurity industries because um, the quicker we can diagnose diseases, the faster we are able to prevent their spread. It's a high security site. Scientists go through airlocks to analyse diseases such as the Hendra virus and foot and mouth. Now they can beam images to colleagues outside the barrier and right across the country. The resolution of this image is absolutely amazing. But it requires big broadband. The plan is to link up multiple sites, but just linking with Sydney chews up the bandwidth. We're peaking here the, the highest performance of the network, so that's basically 40, 50 megabits that are transferred across the sites here. The real breakthrough will come when farms have fast broadband connections and vets in the field can beam back high-quality images of sores on sick animals. Particularly with diseases like foot and mouth disease where you've only got 24 hours to diagnose the disease and put in control measures. Um, being able to see, see the lesions as they are occurring on the animal in a rem remote location is going to be absolutely crucial. It's a world away from life on Matthew and Susan Lester's cattle farm in northwest Tasmania. Never mind the information superhighway, 
they barely got a paved road. Before the satellite came, we were on the um, copper line and you, you literally clicked on to get your emails, go and have your tea for a couple of hours, come back and they'd still be sort of slowly filtering through. So that was pretty painful. I would log on to something, be halfway through internet shopping and the um, line would drop out. So then I'd have to redial and go back into it, which he was happy with because it cut down the amount of money I was spending. <laughs> The satellite link is better, but it's expensive and still not very good. We've got the dish there up on the, on the roof. I'm not sure of the numbers of the speed that it comes in, but compared to um, you know, our brother and brother-in-laws up in Sydney and um, some of the um, speeds they achieve are ri ridiculously fast compared to what we get here. No, it's not working properly here. Why not? Because when I press down the keyboard, it's not reacting straight away. The frustration of the children with the slow connection is palpable. Normally with school, the, it'll load straight up like that as soon as you click on it. And why it's slower here, is it? Mm -hmm. Is it a lot slower here? Yep, nearly five times slower. Is it? Yeah. Um, and is it always slower? Yep. And is that frustrating for you? Yeah, it gets really annoying when it doesn't, um, it doesn't react to the movement that I use. Now, I don't know why this is loading, probably because I've played it before this fast. Um, it's, it doesn't normally load this fast, it's probably just because I've played it before or something. Mm -hmm. And it's more than child's play. Susan Lester feels her family is being disadvantaged by the lack of broadband. What's the other option? We just all move into the city? Some, you know, we have to live here. We have to provide the food that you guys are eating. So we need the access, and our children need the access for their education, and we need the access for the health. We shouldn't be behind you guys just because we choose to live here. The digital divide is not just city rural. Even in city suburbs and major towns, some people are still on dial-up. And over copper wire, the further away from the exchange you live, the worse the broadband gets. If Australia is to overcome the digital divide and provide ubiquitous fast broadband, the system needs upgrading. But there's an ideological chasm over how it should be done. One thing I think we can say is that uh, every big infrastructure in this country, uh, the electricity grid, the rail network, the road network, the old telephone network, um, have all been built uh, or led by government um, on the sort of cross-subsidy model that the NBN Co also embodies. Uh, the real question is, you know, is fibre going to be an essential infrastructure in the same way as those other infrastructures? The vision, the big idea, everyone having fast broadband, we all sign up to that. It's the way they're going about it that's the problem. Australia is the only country in the world, the only country in the world that has renationalized its telco network. That ought to tell you a bundle right there. The market has conspicuously failed. The market cannot deliver ubiquitous, cheap and affordable access to broadband across the whole country. It hasn't happened won't happen and it won't happen in the future. John Howard gave 11 and a half years of opportunity for the market to fix this problem and it failed. And as the NBN continues to roll out, so the political argument will roll on unabated until the next election, where it will no doubt again be an issue. There's more on this saga in a joint online production between Four Corners and the ABC's online investigative unit. That's at abc.net.au slash fourcorners. Next week, we'll be replaced for the night due to the broadcast of the two-part ABC drama series, Paper Giants. We'll be back the following...